when I was asked to uh, make this presentation, future proofing facades, I was thinking what you may expect from me to present, and what is my understanding of this title. My understanding is future proofing facade, and forgive me for my poor English, is the instrument of the long lasting quality of the coatings you apply to the buildings or facades. Okay. <coughs> Today's market drivers, before I come to my more technically driven presentation, just two slides which I have collected. Today's market drivers, as you can see, macroeconomical trends, business and industry trends, and environmental aspects, which coming more and more. I think no need to make this PowerPoint karaoke, as um, all of you from the daily business are affected by these aspects. Higher warranty demands, combined with sustainability aspects, cost control, let's say global political aspects, all these affects your daily operations. This I found, luckily, from an English or British, sorry for that, I think he's an English writer from the 18th century. Read it, keep it for you, and uh, I think no need to explain. When we like to follow certain quality aspects, we cannot talk always about cheap, cheap or prices or whatever. It is, let's say, the value aspect we talk about, the cost aspect, keep it for you. I don't know what is the intention behind. I think you all will have access to this presentation later on. So, on this. My speaker today is divided into three sections, specifications, sustainability, and supply chains. Don't take it so serious, the subtitles, when we talk about pre-treatment systems. Let me start with specification. To my understanding is to show you the complexity behind the powder paint, which means the pretreatment itself. Have a look at the generic overview about the potential of the potential possible pretreatment. Which you can see long cycle, standard cycle, short cycle, <coughs> conversion coatings, alkaline and acid pretreatment, anodizing. There are myriad of options in the pretreatment. Let me start from the end, which is the conversion. Before I come to my focus today is the etching and cleaning. Conversion, what does it mean? Oh, I have to go back. First, we have the alternative, the long proven chromating, which some of you still use, some of you not, which is either the yellow chrome, which is hexavalent chromium in the surface, in the layer, or the chrome phosphate, which means trivalent chrome in the layer. We have the alternative trivalent chrome passivation. We have the alternative chrome-free passivation. And finally, we have the anodization as a pretreatment prior to the paint. All these different pretreatment technologies has advantages, disadvantages, limitations, all are well proven, all suitable, and they follow all the same approach to act as a primer for a good adhesion of a final coating or paint, and to act as a corrosion protection. I give you a generic comparison overview, really generic, between the three systems, chromate, <coughs> chrome-free, Anodizing. Again, I will not read everything. Let me put the focus on. Uh, where is this laser? <coughs> is it here? The focus here between chrome, chrome free, and anodizing. For me, the focus is look at the coating weight, the layer you apply on the aluminum substrate. Because this makes, gives you an explanation why <coughs> the corrosion performance of all these systems are different. It is just because of the thickness of the layer on top. Look to the dimensions. Coming from anodizing, having five <coughs> micron thickness or additional layer on top of the aluminum substrate. When we transfer this to chromate, 
which means roughly 0.5 to 1 micron th thickness. But if you go to the today's modern chrome-free alternative systems, it is less than a tenth of a chromate layer. This means simply we have a natural barrier between the environment, UV, humidity, whatever, before it comes to the aluminum substrate, which gives a different performance in the corrosion. Again, the final comp comparison. But finally, what is most important is all three systems are somehow approved or accepted <coughs> by QualiCode. So all systems still valid. Again, as already discussed before lunch break, with limitations, advantages. I know some of you, and sorry, I'm from Germany and um, in other parts of the world, the use of chromate is not that intensive as it might be in England. You see here, when I look to recyclability, three question marks when I look to chromated systems. Yes, you may argue the quantity of chromate on top of the surface is very low. When we talk recycling, remelting, or whatever, I don't know if it will affect or not. I don't know what will be legislative saying in 10 years or whatever. So for this, I put some question marks in. Um, all approved by QualiCode. And this brings me to the, final, to the one important point. Take QualiCode specifications, organization, as supporting you, not as limiting you. It gives you a lot of helping hands how you can make your business every day by looking at the specifications given by QualiCode. As it is describing in many, many details, no need to go through, the pre-treatment process which is required to ensure certain quality. In particular, there is a focus on the etching stage in the QualiCode specifications. In order to save some time, I go through, you can read by yourself in the specification, Many, many details are defined by QualiCode, with some good reasons, because there are many, many efforts invested in the past years. Learning from experiences in the field, which gives this data collection, that we call the best practice, or however you call it. Showing what you as applicator has to control, or are asked to control. How to do the pretreatment in the liquids. <coughs> My focus today is to show you the good final quality of the coated surface is never a result of one single, let's say, treatment or aspect. You can see it is always the result of a combination <coughs> having a good substrate, as Dr. Mota was also explaining, some good pretreatment and the paint system. As you can see here, I have referred to Qualico 3.0, introduced by Dr. Mota before. Focusing on the substrate, this means the aluminum quality. Pretreatment will be my part, and is also regulated in the Qualico general specifications. The paint system, I left a blank, because it is for me something to work on for future, to learn the counteractions between the paint systems, doesn't matter what it is, and the pretreatment Unfortunately, the sequence is a bit not logical, but before I come to the etching and technical aspect, let me jump to the sustainability aspects. In today's time, I can go through it quickly. I did not compare chromate and chrome-free pretreatment system. I, of course, you may imagine I have some preference, but I don't want to give my favor here. But when you look to today's existing acid or alkaline etch systems. You may check what you are using today. Today's modern systems enable you to save waters 10, 15, 20% to save plant installations. You can read by yourself. All these aspects supporting your sustainability aspects. And don't forget, sustainability does not mean automatically higher costs. No, no, it is just opposite. It can offer you also some cost advantages in your total process when you look to sustainable aspects. When we look now to the conversion, the same here, <coughs> saving in effluent 
saving in wastewater treatment. Cost savings, not only in cost savings, savings in waste disposal, which includes cost savings for each of it. Compared to chromate system. So trust the technology which are available today on the market. It gives a lot of options in terms of sustainability, offering you also some economical advantages for your operations. But now come back to my main point. As explained, the long-lasting quality is always a combination of having a focus on substrate, pretreatment, and paint application. Substrate and pretreatment we cannot separate, so I put it all together. I ask you, when you look to these three pictures, which surface <coughs> looks more confident to you? This is underneath the paint. Just keep it on your mind for later inspection. You need to know a little bit about the background. I don't want to make you become a metallurgist or chemist, but there are some basic rules which, when you understand behind, it's easier to understand the whole process. This is the cut of, a, as you can see, of the aluminum substrate, each of it. Extrusion or sheath produced by rolling, all look like this. We have the pure aluminum metal, we have so-called <coughs> deformation layer. Please don't ask me why this is called deformation layer. It is a given name. You see the dimensions, natural oxide, uh, inclusions, whatever it is, fine. You know, independently, if we talk about chromate conversion, in former times phosphating, or today's chrome-free, it's easy, we know, we need the blank metal that the conversion can be applied. So you may think, look, it's easy to remove everything from the top that we can have a reliable reaction with the conversion code. And this is the background why a particular quality code is demanding a certain edge rate to remove all of these from the surface. Keep the dimension same, and you will later on, you will learn a bit later how difficult it is. For me, the key is the following. Because in theory, it looks easy. But the, for me, the problem is the following. We all talk about the alloy composition. So Kamata explained the amount of foreign elements, copper, iron, silicon, magnesium, whatever. For me, this is not the key, as long as it's all in the specification. And all of you who are from the applicator side know sometimes you have some claims, and then your customer or pre-supplier is saying, Oh, the yellow is in the specification, but then you ask me, why do I have these failures? Which is not sometimes not easy to explain. For me, it is the distribution of these foreign elements is not well known. This means how much of the foreign elements can be found where? Always on top or close to the surface or more deeper in the material? Or what is the problem here? And no one can predict this behavior. And this makes it so difficult to say we need a high edge rate in order to ensure to remove everything. Or maybe it is sufficient to have a lower edge rate. So the problem is to, to know where are the elements which are affecting, not us, but the surface in terms of paint adhesion or corrosion behavior. As shown already before, this is the composition. We have oil and grease from the fabrication process. It means from extrusion or rolling. We have particles from the same. And we have these elements in the substrate. And you may ask why I choose two different colors. It's easy. Some of the elements are soluble only in acid solution. Some other elements are soluble in alkaline solution. And this is the explanation why it is so important. Now we come back to the quality code specification to insist on an acid etching step in the pretreatment because we have to remove reliably all these elements from the surface. Let me start from here. This we need an oxide free 
and residue-free surface, we need to have a proper conversion as a corrosion protection and paint adhesion promoter. If you go only with alkaline step, which would be fine, but then you remove only the oil and grease, you may remove some part of the dust and particles, but you will not remove the oxide or deformation layer. So that means this surface is not well prepared for the final paint. If you go for alkaline pickling, yes, oil and grease again removed, particles removed, oxide is removed, deformation layer might be removed, but we will have some remaining alloy elements which are not soluble in alkaline solutions, which means we will have a pickling deposit on top of the surface, which simply hinders you to have a proper conversion of painted tissue. So what you must do is either a combination of alkaline and acidic treatment or simple single acidic treatment to, in, oh, sorry, to enable you to have a deposit-free, oxide-free, deformation layer-free surface before you go for paint. This is the only way to enable you to have the proper quality. Independently, if we talk about chromate conversion or chrome-free conversion, this surface preparation is the key for the success of your operation if you're coming from the applicator side. Now, I, for this slide, I will make some bit karaoke. Why is this so important? Copper, iron, and zinc are decisive for the corrosion behavior. If not removed reliably, it can affect. As Dr. Botta explained, if it's still bounded in the substrate, fine. I don't mind how much you will have. But as soon it is, let's say, opened and can be released on the surface, it will affect immediately the corrosion performance. These are the examples of having a, the differences to show between the different edge rates. And for this good reason, it is prescribed in quality code to have a minimum edge rate of one gram per square meter or for season application of two grams per square meter. For those of you, you may remember today morning when he was started his, 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 um, his speech, in the past, the history from France, there was even a quite higher demand or requirement on edge rate. In the beginning of France, Gallimarie, now it's called today, they were asking for an edge rate of 8 grams per square meter. It was 15 years ago when they started to have it. But you see, not etching is not only the key. We need a certain amount of etching to remove reliably alloying components and deposits from the surface. Now I come back to this picture, which we had before. Easy to explain and to understand. I think all of us agree that the picture on the right looks more convincing as a proper pretreatment before the paint is uh, just being applied, as you can read, by a proper etching. So you need to understand the complexity behind the system. Oops, why does not go on? No. To avoid failures like this, this is the only way by following very proper pretreatment, <coughs> considering observing the impact of the metallurgy. And to those of you who does not have his own extrusion or even his own smelting, which means you are jobbers, it's difficult because you cannot see on the substrate if this is done properly or not. You can just do a pretreatment and paint in the way it is. And thanks that we have these regulations like quality code or in other regions of the world on other specifications. This was our want to talk about today. Again, to show the complexity behind the, let's say, long-lasting quality is always a result of looking at the substrate plus pretreatment plus the paint application. Thank you so much. To those of you who are still staying on chromate, and um, I just found today morning, for this I have this paper here, December last year, since December 2021, it was a kind of anniversary. Because 25 years ago, December 1996, the first approval was given to an alternative chrome-free pretreatment, alternatively to the chromate. 
which simply means, again, all systems still in use, all have advantages or disadvantages, or let me call it limitations, but looking at the history of already 25 years, chrome-free pretreatment can make you feel confident that it works today. <coughs>